Well, good evening and welcome to our time together in the Word of God. I have my headphones on for a purpose. It's because I'm going to be listening to some, some good music, which will be produced by our worship team, the junior members of our worship team. So I want you to stand by and listen to them.
beautiful song there by our worship team. What a beautiful name. Speaking about, of course, the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus. Let's pray. Father, we pause now and give you thanks for this day. We thank you for your mercy, your goodness to all of us. We thank you for your protection during this time. We thank you for your guidance and for your inspiration. We thank you that you're still a God that's at work in this world. You were not just at work sometime in the past, way back in the ancient days or in the days of Christ. You are at work right now. And so we can appeal to you and we can come to you and we can worship you knowing that we can still connect with you in a very personal way. We pray that we can just somehow or another enhance that connectivity as we get into your word and see you at work in the lives of your people. We ask you to guide our time of study together tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, we are going to be looking at Genesis chapter 43 and into a portion of chapter 44. We're, the story really picks up from verse 11 of Genesis, Genesis 43, uh, verse 11, all the way through about verse 17 of chapter 44. But I'm going to read from the beginning of chapter 43, um, so just stay with me as we read this uh, this portion of Scripture, because I think then you'll get a better sense, uh, really, of what um, of what what's 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 going on. Is the context? Context makes a difference. So we're going to read together God's word. It says that now the famine was severe in the land, and when they had eaten the grain that they had brought from Egypt, their father said to them, "Go again, buy a little food." But Judah said to him, The man solemnly warned us, saying, You shall not see my face unless your brother is with you. If you will not send our brother with us, we will go down. And by, if you will send our brother with us, we will go down and buy you food. But if you will not send him, we shall not go down. For the man said to us, You shall not see my face unless your brother is with you. Israel said, why did you treat me so badly as to tell the man that you had another brother? And they replied, The man questioned us carefully about ourselves and our kindred, saying, Is your father still alive? Do you have another brother? When we told, What we told him was in answer to these questions. Could we in any way know that he would say, Bring your brother down? And Judah said to his father, Israel his father, Send the boy with me. And we will arise and go, that we may live and not die, both we and you and also our little ones. I will be a pledge of his safety. From my hand you shall receive him. If I do not bring him back to you and set him before you, then let me bear the blame forever. If we had not delayed, we would, have, we would now have returned twice. Then their father Israel said to them, if it must be so, then do this. Take some of the choice fruits of the land in your bags and carry a present down to the man, a little balm and a little honey and gum and myrrh and pistachio nuts and almonds. Take double the money with you. Carry back with you the money that was returned in the mouth of your sacks. Perhaps it was an oversight. Take also your brother and arise and go again to the man. May God Almighty grant you mercy before the man. And may he send back your other brother and Benjamin. As for me, if I am bereaved of my children, I am bereaved. So the men took their, this present, and they took double the money with them and Benjamin. They arose and went down to Egypt and stood before Joseph. When Joseph saw Benjamin with them, he said to the steward of his house, Bring the men into the house, and slaughter an animal and make ready, for the men are to dine with me at noon. The man did as Joseph told him and brought the men to Joseph's house. And the men were afraid because they were brought to Joseph, Joseph's house. And they said, It is because of the money which was replaced in our sacks uh, the first time that we are brought in, so that he may assault us and fall upon us and make us servants and seize our donkeys. So they went up to the steward of Joseph's house and spoke with him at the door of the house and said, O oh, my Lord, we came down the first time to buy food. And when we came to the lodging place, we opened our sacks, and there was each man's money in the mouth of his sack. 
our money in full weight. So we have brought it again with us, and we have brought other money down with us to buy food. We do not know who put our money in our sacks. He replied, Peace to you, do not be afraid. Your God and the God of your father has put treasure in your sacks for you. I received your money. Then he brought Simeon out to them. And when the man had brought the men into Joseph's house and given them water, and they had washed their feet, and when he had given their donkeys fodder, they prepared the present for Joseph's coming at noon, for they heard that he that they should eat bread there. When Joseph came home, they brought into the house to him the present that they had with them, and bowed down to him at the ground. And he inquired about their welfare, and said, Is your father well, the old man of whom you spoke? Is he still alive? And they said, Your servant, our father, is well, he is still alive. And they bowed their heads and prostrated themselves. And he lifted up his eyes and saw his brother Benjamin, his mother's son, and said, Is this your youngest brother, of whom you spoke to me? God be gracious to you, my son. Then Joseph hurried out, for his compassion grew warm for his brother, and he sought a place to weep. And he entered his chamber and wept there. Then he washed his face and came out, and controlling himself, he said, Serve the food. They served him by himself, and then by themselves, and the Egyptians who ate with him by themselves, because the Egyptians could not eat with the, with the Hebrews, for that is an abomination to the Egyptians. And they sat before him, the firstborn according to his birthright, and the youngest according to his youth. And the men looked at one another in amazement. Portions were taken to them from Joseph's table, but Benjamin's portion was five times as much as any of theirs. And they drank and were merry with him. Continuing into chapter 44. Then he commanded the steward of his house, Fill the men's sacks with food, as much as they can carry, and put each man's money in the mouth of his sack, and put my cup, the silver cup, in the mouth of the sack of the youngest, with his money for the grain. And he did as Joseph told him. As soon as the morning was light, the men were sent away with their donkeys. They had gone only a short distance from the city. Now Joseph said to his steward, Up, follow after the men, and when you overtake them, say to them, Why have you repaid evil for good? Is it not from this that my Lord drinks, and by this that he practices divination? You have done evil in doing this. When he overtook them, he spoke to them these words. They said to him, Why does my Lord speak such words as these? Far be it from your servant to do such a thing. Behold, the money that we found in the mouths of our sacks we brought back to you from the land of Canaan. How then could we steal silver or gold from our, your Lord's house? Whichever of your servants is found with, this, with it shall die, and we also will be my Lord's servants. He said, Let it be as you say, he who is found with with it shall be my servant, and the rest of you shall be innocent. Then each man quickly lowered his sack to the ground, and each man opened his sack. And he searched, beginning with the eldest and ending with the youngest, and the cup was found in Benjamin's sack. Then they tore their clothes, and every man loaded his donkey, and they returned to the city. When Judah and his brothers came to Joseph's house, he was still there. They fell before him to the ground. Joseph said to them, What deed is this that you have done? Do you not know that a man like me can indeed practice divination? And Judah said, What shall we say to my Lord? What shall we speak? Or how can we clear ourselves? God has found out the guilt of your servants. Behold, we are my Lord's servants, both we and he also, in whose hand the cup has been found. But he said, Far be it from me that I should do such should do so. Only the man in whose hand the cup was found shall be my servant. But as for you, go up in peace to your father. We're going to pause there. It's a very critical point in this story. But we're going to pause there because when we pick back up the story uh, next week, 
we will see how things flow. Now, of course, you will have time to read it between that, but between now and then. But I just want you to, to recognize that one of the things that, that, that's happening here, of course, in this drama, that to one, from one perspective, is, it's a test. And from another perspective, it could be considered a torture. For those of us who have read the book of Job, we, we understand clearly that, that all the pain and all the suffering and all the grief that Job experienced were really part of a test. But of course, from Job's perspective, it was a torture. When we ourselves go through harrowing experiences and it seems like God is either absent or, in, or, or God is punishing us directly, there are no easy answers at those times. The only thing we can safely rely on is the fact that if it is God who is behind it, then it is a test that he's allowing into our lives. Because of his love for us, his motive is always for what is good for us, never to harm us. And so Joseph himself had experienced enough of God's mercy, enough of God acting in his life. When Joseph had gone through some very, very difficult times, he had experienced enough to have learned that God had allowed him to be tested before he was placed in this position of authority and this position of influence. He had passed the test, which is why he is now second in command to Pharaoh. Now, in our study thus far of this story of Joseph, we have focused only on his merits and his strengths. Only a couple of times, a couple of occasions did I mention possibly that though Joseph in many ways is really symbolic of Jesus, but he is not without fault, yes, only Jesus is faultless. The portion of the story that we just read, in which Joseph is shown dealing with his brothers, causes us to question to what extent Joseph was subject to human faults and weaknesses. For although he, he does not deal as harshly with his brothers as he, shall we say, was entitled to because of what they did to him, he still puts them through quite an emotional ringer, doesn't he? But what was his motive? What was his motive? Because motive is the key. From verse 15 of chapter 40, uh, 43, we see the brothers, including Benjamin, travel down to Egypt. The father had said, okay, if you have to go, go. And if my sons don't return, then I've lost them both. On arrival, these brothers immediately tell Joseph's steward that they had found their, the silver from the previous purchase in their sacks, but they themselves were not at fault because they hadn't done it. He told them not to be concerned that the silver was a gift from God. Now, when Joseph sees them with Benjamin in their midst, well, he has taken them to his personal dwelling of course, without telling them why. And as we read, they were afraid when they found that he was, that they were taken to his personal dwelling. And then he had them seated according to age. And then he throws a, a big feast for them. But even then, what's happened is that Benjamin is singled out and given five times as much as the others. They were amazed that, how, how, how come... We didn't tell anybody who's the oldest and who's the next and who's the next and who's the next. But yet we are seated according to our age from oldest to youngest. But we need to note, of course, what we read. How emotional Joseph became when he saw his brother Benjamin. Perhaps at that moment, Joseph was tempted to reveal himself to his brothers. But no, not yet. Not yet. After going aside and crying, he returned to his brothers for the meal. And after the feast, Joseph orders his steward to fill their sacks with grain, return all their silver to them, and in addition, in addition to, to put his personal silver cup into Benjamin's sack. Now we can see, Joseph, is, of course, is up to something. And 
we see how it plays out. Now, this is done on the brothers with great relief, all 11 of them. Now, Simeon included, they head for home. But of course, as we read, their respite from the, the emotional onslaught is short lived. For they hadn't gone very far when Joseph's uh, servant, his steward, rides up to them and accuses them of stealing his master's silver cup. Now, the men vehemently protest the accusation, going as far as to say that whomever is found with the silver cup shall die and everybody else will become slaves. But imagine their shocked distress when the cup is found in Benjamin's bag. As the scripture states to us, they tore their clothes. In a pall of emotional distress, they return to the city. And then when Joseph sees them, he accuses them of theft. In utter confusion, and deep distress, they're speechless. Judah's words were, what can we say? How can we prove our innocence? God has uncovered your servant's guilt. Now, let's notice that statement. God has uncovered your servant's guilt. God has found out our guilt, our wrongdoing. This last reference is not to the stealing of the silver cup, of course, but to the horrific act they had committed against Joseph 22 years before. Clearly, the events that have unfolded from their first trip to Egypt had brought their guilt to the surface of their minds. Now, Joseph knew exactly what Judah was referring to and that it was not to the matter of the cup. At this point, it seems that Joseph's heart would not have permitted him to continue with this cruel test. But somehow, he keeps on. He insists that Benjamin must remain as his slave while the others may return to their father in peace. Now, even Benjamin is caused to feel the sting of revenge. Or is that really what it is? You see, we've come to the crucial point in Joseph's testing of the character of his brothers. These were the very men who had happily sold him into slavery. And Benjamin was his only full-blooded brother, the son of his mother and his father. Would it bother them if Benjamin was also a slave? It didn't seem to bother them when Joseph was sold into slavery. Now, we might question Joseph's, uh, whether Joseph really needed to, to test uh, the character of his brothers to this extent. In other words, whether it was not, his desire to test them was not mixed with some desire for them to taste their own medicine. We can question that. But of course, the reality is that, we you know, judgment and Retribution belong to the Lord alone. So even if there are good reasons for Joseph to, or were good reasons for Joseph to test his, his, the character of his brothers, and, and yes, there was a good reason for Joseph to test these men to see whether they were the same men who had sold him into slavery, whether there was any change in their character. Well, the experience uh, that he had had with them previously kind of a pushed him towards testing and maybe even doing more than a test for them because later on what we'll see is that after, after Israel dies, Jacob, Israel, the same person, dies, Joseph finds out that his treatment of his brothers on this particular occasion had been so deeply imprinted in the hearts and the psyche and the minds of these, these men, in their very souls, that they had never really accepted his forgiveness of them. And so his game of having them run the gauntlet in some way actually backfired. Let's pause at this crucial point in this drama and consider something relevant to us today. Whether it's in the home, it's in the church, or in society at large, we must learn to forgive. 
but not only to forgive. We must learn to let God handle our interpersonal relationships. Vengeance is mine, says the Lord. I will repay. Yes, we may have an obligation to discipline if we are in positions where we have to correct those under us, including our children, but we never have a right and we never have an obligation to exact revenge. Now, what I'm saying is that based on what we have previously seen of Joseph's character and what we know about what he suffered at his brother's hands, and as uncomfortable as we are with the with observing this painful scene that is played out before us, and also understand full, understanding full well that Joseph may not have got it all right. That this whole experience that Joseph put his brothers through was intended as a test and not as an act of revenge. That's Joseph's perspective. The brothers felt differently, of course. Now, this will become more clear to us as we reach the climatic moment in this story, which, of course, begins in verse 17. But that's, that's for our next time together. Again, what we've said earlier is that we see so much in Joseph that is admirable. And so when we see him putting his brothers through this, this test, we become very uncomfortable and we wonder, hasn't he gone too far? Hasn't he gone too far? I suppose if we had been in Joseph's shoes and had experienced what he experienced uh, at the hands of his brothers, I believe that we might be inclined to have executed, in a sense, a similar test. We want to know. Are these men still so cold-hearted? Have they already taken the life of my brother, my only full-blooded brother, Benjamin? That's why I want to see him. I want to know he's still alive. Are these men trustworthy? Now, it's a drama, but it's one that reminds us something. God does test us as well. God does test us as well. And sometimes when we're going through the tests that, that God allows to come our way, like Joseph's brothers, and like Job, and like other saints, we maybe think, this is torture. What's going on? We need to remember that whatever God allows us to go through is always for our good. When we have been tested and proved, we want to know that we come forth like gold because our faith will be tested. Our character will be tested. It is being tested right now. Right now, our character is being tested and our faith in God is being tested and our love for our brothers and sisters is being tested. I find it very difficult, and maybe you do as well, to, to listen to some of the dialogue and read some of the comments that, that, that Christians make regarding other Christians, but simply because we don't agree with the same political agenda or ideology or don't have the same view on the, what's, the actions of government locally and otherwise regarding vaccination and other mandates. And we, 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 are, we are drawing some very solid lines in the dirt. In fact, we're creating chasms for people to cross. Brothers and sisters, this too will pass. This COVID-19 pandemic will pass. Don't allow it to destroy the fabric and the, the, the structure, even the foundation of our relationship as brothers and sisters. Under such stress that we're going through, we're all going to make mistakes. We're all going to sometimes forget to wear a mask or forget to sanitize or 
forget to keep a social distancing. We're going to mess up at some point in time. But I trust that we're able to forgive one another for those faux pas, those messing ups. This will pass. And I trust that we will have learned something from it that will make us stronger believers, stronger Christians. People who stand with each other instead of who stand against each other. Let's close this time with prayer again. Sovereign Lord and Heavenly Father, we thank you for your love and your mercy to us. We thank you for your goodness, your faithfulness. We see it played out in the life of Joseph. You allowed him to be tested severely. And he came forth as gold, and so he was promoted because he passed the test. And we see Joseph testing his brothers, wanting to know whether they were trustworthy. Lord, we are being tested right now. We are being tested in terms of how we treat one another, how we deal with you, whether we trust you, whether we believe in you, and how we respond and how we react and deal with those in authority. Yes, we read the scripture that we should obey those in authority, but we, so many of us are trying to find all kinds of reasons why not to obey or follow the leadings of our authorities. Because I suppose it means that deep down inside of us, we, there's a growing distrust of authority. Help us, Lord, to remember that all authority has been given by you. Yes, you established it here in this country and elsewhere. We pray that you would help us to be people who encourage and support one another during this difficult time. Not to be attacking each other because we disagree on some particular approach to dealing with this pandemic. Support one another pray for one another, and to to stand alongside of each other so that we go through this together. We ask that you remember those who are suffering, children and adults alike, from COVID-19. We ask that you would help churches and other organizations that have a, a sense of conscience for those who are hurting, to find ways to reach out to the hurting, the needy, the distressed. We pray for those who need a miracle from you right now, Lord, those who are in the hospital, here or abroad. They need a divine touch. Lord, you are more than able. Yes, you are able to do more than we can ask, think, or even imagine So, Lord, we are asking that you perform miracles so that Christ's name will be glorified. We pray this in his precious and matchless name. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. As we close, we want to remind you of uh, upcoming events again. And we trust that even though some of these things, uh, in a sense, they're planned, We don't know how all these things will come off because we are in uncertain times. But we are in uncertain times with a certain sure God who is with us and who will take us through these times. We still have plans for regular services. um, And we just have to work with what we have before us. Um, And if there are changes in numbers and changes in other details, we'll let you know as soon as we know ourselves. Until next time, God bless.